welcome or welcome back to Dark Case Documentaries. I bring you true crime, disturbing stories and other things that you may later regret knowing with at least two new videos every single week. Please do join the quickly growing Dark Case family by hitting subscribe now and turning on notifications. Our love and respect goes out to all those that knew and loved Savannah. On Thursday, January the 3rd, 2019, Savannah Spurlock, aged 22, planned to go out that night with a small group of friends. It would be her first night out in months after giving birth to twin sons just a few weeks prior. Having twins was understandably overwhelming, so their father looked after them to relieve some of the pressure from Savannah. Additionally to the twins, she also had two other boys, who were then aged four and two. Ellen Spurlock, Savannah's mother, volunteered to watch the boys while Savannah was enjoying her first night of freedom in close to a year. Savannah, Ellen and the kids lived in Lexington, Kentucky. Savannah's plans to go out with friends were welcomed by Ellen because she felt her daughter needed a break. She was happy to help make the night happen. Mother Ellen lent her car to Savannah for the night. Excited for a night of fun and letting her hair down, she drove the car to one friend's house. There, she left the car. The three friends then drove to a bar, confusingly called The Other Bar in Lexington, in one of the friend's cars. After enjoying some drinks together, one of the friends left early in the night, but Savannah and her remaining friend kept the night going. However, as can often happen on a night out, the two friends then had an argument. The two then split up, the friend went home, but Savannah stayed out alone in the bar. A few hours later, at around 2.30am, Savannah too departed the bar. Soon after, she FaceTimed Mother Ellen to let her know she would return later that morning. Following the call, Ellen went to sleep, believing her daughter would return home shortly. Following that call, Ellen went to sleep, believing that her daughter would return home shortly. When Ellen awoke the next morning, she came to the heart-stopping realisation that her beloved daughter never arrived home. Savannah didn't often go on nights out and was very family conscious. Ellen knew that Savannah would not likely go AWOL and leave her boys without their mother for a long period of time of her own free will. Panic now rising, she tried to call her, but her phone was either off or her battery was dead. Uh, we do not have her cell phone, uh, so uh, we would like to have the cell phone. Uh, we're looking for her and the cell phone. But we know for sure that the cell phone went out of service around 8.30 to 8.45 that morning. Um, how it went out of service, we don't know. Um, but we know that it did. Uh, and it hasn't been turned back on. Later that day, Ellen could no longer sit and wait. She had to take action. She reported her daughter missing. Savannah's about five foot tall. She's 140 pounds. She had kind of reddish brown auburn hair. She has some tattoos, a rose on her shoulder, a Bible verse, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me, and on her back she has a tattoo that says, I am her daughter. Police began their investigation. The Lexington Bar security footage was obtained by the police after speaking with Savannah's friends. This was the last confirmed sighting of her at this time. On this CCTV footage, Savannah, along with three men, were seen leaving the bar. None of the men that she left with were previously known to her, according to information from her friends. The friends also said that they hadn't seen or spoken to the men in the bar either. When her daughter FaceTimed her, Ellen claimed that she appeared to be fine and unconcerned. Savannah was in a car when Ellen spoke with her and she saw a man behind the wheel. The man wasn't someone that Ellen recognised. The fact that she had seen her daughter being driven by a man she didn't know now brought feelings of dread. Although Ellen claimed that she couldn't see them very well, she said that there were one or two other people in the back of the car. She said they were hollering and talking over each other, so she couldn't really hear what was going on. Ellen responded that Savannah did not appear disturbed and that nothing appeared unusual when asked by the police as to whether she appeared distressed. Savannah assured her of her safety. I will be home later this morning. I promise. Police started searching for the males that Savannah was seen with in the video. Through their investigation, they were able to identify both the men and the vehicle that Savannah was riding in. They confirmed that Savannah was not familiar with the men prior to this night, but that the three men did all know each other. They were close friends. 
Police believed that two of the males were in the car with Savannah, while the third followed them in a different vehicle. Police then created a timeline of the night. Savannah indeed left the other bar with the three men. The four of them then travelled to a property owned by one of the men. The man that owned the house was named David Sparks. He was 23 years old. They travelled 40 miles or so from Lexington to Garrett County. When they arrived in Garrett County, police could not yet determine whether Savannah stayed there or moved to yet another location. David Sparks and the other two males were taken in for questioning by the police. David acknowledged that that evening the three of them did indeed exit the bar with Savannah. All four of them then travelled to Garrett County. However, the two other men eventually left, leaving David and Savannah alone. For the first time, we were able to watch police interviews with the two men who were with them that night. They all ended up at Sparks' Garrett County home. They said Spurlock was alive when they left the house. And she hurt that girl? Yeah. Would he tell you? Yeah, I feel like he eventually would. Have you asked him that yet? Yeah. I asked him. He'd be adamant that he don't know nothing. That's why, that's why I asked him, like, like, bro, you need to be... 100% a like on point because this is with us all. But like I told him at the end of the day, bro, like you, she, we left that show house, bro. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> me and left. So whatever the happened after that, you need to go ahead, man, up and say you need to be said. David, however, denied that anything happened between the two of them. He told authorities that he used the couch as a bed so that Savannah could use the actual bed. David said he couldn't remember the time, but he recalled Savannah waking up at some point and asking for the location of the house that they were in. He claims that he told her and then went back to sleep. She had left by the time he woke up later that morning at around noon. He speculated that she may have got in touch with someone and given them the address so that they could take her home to her family. At that point, her friend had left her. She was upset and she trusted that they were good people. Cops also released these images of Savannah standing outside with no coat. That made me like sick to my stomach. You can just look at her face and tell that is not Savannah. Something's wrong. Do you think it's credible that she would have walked out the front door and into the night? I do not believe her just walking out that door. She would have called one of us. She would have called her mom. She would have called someone to come get her. I hope that she is being held somewhere and she is still fighting for her babies and her family and her friends. Kayla Hamblin is part of Savannah's inner circle. She says the night the mom of four vanished, Savannah was with a different friend for her first girls' night out. I do think she was going through a tough time because she did just have the two twin boys. And at the time, she wasn't aware that she was having twins. She thought she was only having one baby. People can use that to say that she might have wanted to run away from her life, but she would not Kayla hopes Savannah will be found soon and has this emotional message for her best friend. That I love you and I will never give up on finding you. The Garrett County farm property owned by his parents was searched by police after obtaining a search warrant, but Savannah was nowhere to be found. Therefore, none of the men were detained or given any sort of legal notice. Somebody out there, please, they know something. And put this nightmare to rest so we get some kind of closure. Search teams have scoured hundreds of acres and discovered a piece of fabric the exact same color as the skirt Savannah was wearing the night she disappeared. In July 2019, six months after the incident, David's father called the police to report that a bad smell was emanating from a location on his property. When the police arrived at the site, they discovered a small section of earth that had been previously disturbed. The earth covered a hole that was only 19 inches in depth. Under a rug, shrouded by trash bags, lay Savannah, clothing removed, feet taped together. How was she missed? There she was the whole time. That's something that uh, I ask myself actually still when I think about Savannah is how did we not find her? How did I not find her? I actually stood on the strawberry patch, like where it was. As part of the initial investigation by Richmond Police Department, the three men last seen with Savannah Spurlock were identified and interviewed, one of which was David Sparks. The investigation indicates that Savannah Spurlock was seen at the residence of David Sparks during the morning hours of January the 5th. As a result of the ongoing investigation, David Sparks, 23 years old of Lancaster, Kentucky, 
was arrested early this morning in connection to the recovery of Savannah Spurlock's body. About four months ago, I believe in February, uh, law enforcement uh, responded to the, the location on Fall uh, Lick Road uh, in Garrett County, at which time a search was done. Um, the, the property is owned. Uh, by some of uh, Mr. Sparks family members. I don't believe that there's any indication uh, that she was placed there uh, recently. Uh, I think that the, the, the odor is what uh, kind of indicated and that's what the information that we received yesterday, that's what led us there. David was now detained by the police. However, he continued to plead his innocence. There were no signs that Savannah's body had been relocated, so it is unclear why she wasn't discovered when the area was examined after she was originally reported missing. The prosecution's case was based on the facts that Savannah was last seen with David, that she returned to the family-owned property and that her body was also discovered there. The rug that was found covering Savannah was also identified by police as one from David's bedroom. A rug was found in his bedroom when it was checked a few days after Savannah was reported missing, but it was later discovered that this rug was a replacement. The investigation revealed that he got in touch with his sister on January the 5th to inquire about the rug's purchase since he desired a new one. Later that day, he was captured on camera in Walmart paying for a rug. Additional evidence embroiled him further. The closet door of his bedroom was covered in Savannah's blood. However, despite the evidence, the prosecution was unable to describe how Savannah passed or what else occurred to her in the early hours of January the 4th. Therefore, they began discussions with David about a potential plea deal since they thought that they wouldn't be able to prove any aggravating circumstances. David agreed to enter a guilty plea to murder and tampering with physical evidence. The plea deal detailed what occurred but did not mention how Savannah passed. It read, during the early hours of January the 4th, 2019, at 118 Price Court in Garrett County, Kentucky, the defendant, acting alone, intentionally caused the death of Savannah Spurlock. After doing so, he bound her legs and wrapped her in plastic bags. He later transported her body and buried her in the yard behind the residence. He did so with the intent to elude apprehension for the crime. David avoided a possible life sentence by entering this guilty plea. Due to COVID-19, the sentencing was broadcast live from the Lincoln County Jail on Zoom. Throughout the sentencing session, he remained silent. Uh, you agreed at that time to plead guilty to the charges of murder, tampering with physical evidence, and abuse of a corpse. The recommendation of the Commonwealth was 50 years on the murder, 5 years on the tampering, 12 months on the abuse of the corpse. All concurrent for a total of 50 years. I will uh, accept that recommendation and impose that sentence. He will be qualified for parole after completing a 20-year sentence. When the judge sentenced David Sparks to 50 years in prison, Savannah Spurlock's family had to watch it on a laptop. I think he got off real easy and real cushy being behind a computer screen, behind a mask, not having to face the people he devastated in person. Andy Sims, the Commonwealth's attorney, outlined their decision to accept a plea offer as opposed to proceeding with the trial and asking for a life sentence. He said, We did not have proof beyond a reasonable doubt for any aggravating circumstances. So, because we didn't have any aggravators, we couldn't seek the three highest penalties in the Commonwealth. The two other males who were captured on camera leaving the bar that evening with Savannah and David were not charged in connection with Savannah's passing. What do you believe happened that night? Do you think this punishment fits the crime? Let me know down in the comments. Hitting a like on the video will help to spread awareness of this case. Join the Dark Case family by subscribing for at least two new videos every week. Thanks to my patrons for helping me to continue in my work. Karen Jones, James Harrington, L. Palmieri, Eddie Alexander, David James, Jason Grout, and Shane Woodward. Look after yourselves and I'll see you soon.